Hey everybody, welcome to Altium Academy. I'm your host, Zach Peterson. Today, we are going to be looking at a viewer question that I received through my personal website about using the microchip LAN8742 component. Now this component is an ethernet transceiver and it has an ethernet Phi built into it. So if you were using a microcontroller that did not have an ethernet Phi interface, you could conceivably use this component to add ethernet into your system. Now the question we got relates to routing the differential pairs and calculating the differential impedance. And I think it's an interesting question because it reveals one confusion about using ethernet in a PCB. So we're gonna jump into this question in this video. And of course, we're going to be doing some work in Altium Designer. So make sure to hop into your copy of Altium Designer and follow along. So first, let's go ahead and take a look at the viewer question. Now, this question was sent into my personal website, and it's an interesting question because it relates to the use of ground below differential pairs, and that's an important guideline when routing high-speed signals, including differential pairs. The person who asked this question is working with the microchip LAN 8742 component. And in looking in the reference literature for this component, they said that it recommends that there are no planes or traces underneath the two differential pairs. All the calculators we found cannot calculate the impedance of differential pairs without a reference plane. How do you solve this problem? And should you actually use ground below the differential pairs? First, if you just take a look at this component, you're gonna see several different pieces of literature here. So on the microchips website, and you'll find the LAN 8742. And if you just scroll down into the documentation section, you'll see here the data sheet, and then you'll see here the theory of operation and a couple other application notes. Now, if you just go into the theory of operation document and you go into the data sheet, what you're actually going to find is you won't find any mention of planes anywhere in this document. In fact, the only mention in the data sheet is to connect the exposed pad on the bottom of this component to a plane. Here in the theory of operation, we don't even see the word plane mentioned. So in this component, we have two differential pairs that are coming off of this component. The first is the RX lines, and then the second is the TX lines coming into this QFN component. So this is a small quad flat pack component with no leads. This component has a ground pad here that is uh, connected directly to the die internal to the component. So this is your VSS terminal, and this is gonna connect directly back to a ground plane. So the reason I bring this up is because clearly you need to have a ground plane somewhere in this system. So there's gonna be ground below this component. And that means that these differential pairs are going to be routed over ground. So let's take a look at the impedance calculations first, and then we can see where we actually find that recommendation for not using ground below differential pairs and how you can actually design the differential pairs to work with that situation where you don't have ground beneath them. So here what I've done inside Altium Designer is I've just created the dummy PCB. Obviously it's blank. And the reason I do that is just to bring up the stack up. So I've created the four layer stack up. Here I wanna show what you can do with the impedance profiler to figure out what the impedance should be in both cases where you have the ground beneath the differential pairs, as well as when you don't have ground and how close you have to bring those pairs together in order to hit your impedance target. So first, let's add a profile and we can see what happens when we have ground as our reference. If we set our target impedance to the value that we need for ethernet, set it to 100 ohms, you can see here it brings the width down significantly, just as we would expect. Now, in this question, what the viewer actually mentioned is that they took this trace gap and they made it very small. They actually made it 3.5 mils, which was the limit of what their fabricator could do and it brings that width for the, each of these lines down to four mils. Now, this is with ground directly beneath the component. So when you have ground directly beneath these differential pairs and then extending underneath the component, you can see here that we get some very thin traces, and when we start to use a very narrow gap, we also get these thin traces. What happens if we don't have ground underneath this component? One way that you can simulate having no ground beneath this component is to basically just make the thickness of this layer very large. So let's say we make this thing 500 mils. Well, at 500 mil thickness, you can see here that it increases the width 
of the differential pair. So each trace in the differential pair is much wider, 6.223 mils, even if we maintain that 3.5 mil trace gap. Once we make that trace gap wider, let's say we make it five mils, go back to the default, you can see that the width required in order to hit this 100 ohm impedance target starts to increase very rapidly. This is important because we went over this point in our routing USB on a two layer board example. And one of the things that we had to go over was how to calculate the impedance in that case. In this case, where we have a very large distance to the nearest ground region, which in this case is 500 mils, we have to put the pairs very close together in order to hit a reasonable width target that can then route into the pins on that component. The question of whether or not this is correct, this is actually a correct calculation. The reason it's correct is because as we expect, we have to bring those traces close together in order to hit a reasonable width target for our target impedance. Now, another dimension to this question. What if instead of using differential, we go with differential coplanar? How does that affect the impedance? Well, in this case, you now have another lever that you can pull, which is this S term here, which is the spacing between the plane region on the same layer and the width. So in this plane region, if I take this clearance and say make it very large, like 500 mils, we basically get back to the same situation we had before, where we have to have reasonably wide traces for a given trace gap in order to hit this 100 ohm impedance target. If I just continue making this even larger, let's say 1,000 mils, you can see that at some point we basically converge to what the impedance is going to be for these traces, regardless of further increases in this spacing between the coplanar copper pore region and the trace. So again, this is also an accurate calculation. So you could use these results for an impedance target in a region where ground is very far away from your traces, or in this case for this question when there is no ground beneath the traces. So the issue here is, yes, we can hit the impedance target. Is it gonna be good for blocking noise? That's another issue because we like to bring ground closer to our signals in order to suppress noise reception in those traces. So this is not good for noise, but it is okay for hitting the impedance target. So now let's look back at the data sheets and some of the literature that Microchip provides on this component. Why would they recommend routing any of this without ground? Well, you have to actually look at how a ethernet channel is designed and how some of the components are placed in order to see where that recommendation comes from. So let's jump back into the literature here. Now, there's another document that Microchip has created to help people design with the LAN 8742 component. And if you actually just Google LAN 8742 differential pair, you'll see this document come up. So it's RC614947A. This is their routing checklist, and I have it open here. So if we just scroll up to the top, you will see that this is their routing checklist for this component, the LAN 8742, for the 24-pin QFN package. So that's exactly what we're working with in this question. Here, they give a short list of guidelines. I actually encourage folks to just scroll down and take a look at what has to happen in this board in order for you to route successfully from the chip, which is right here where my mouse is, over to the left, which is where a connector is. So inside of an ethernet channel, we actually have two traces coming off of the chip. Those traces come over here to a circuit involving some magnetic coupling. And then the output from that magnetic coupling circuit goes over to your connector. And so this is the region where they're actually recommending not having any ground. The next question is, of course, should you actually do this? Is this an appropriate approach? It really depends. It depends on the situation that you're designing for. Here in this situation, they're just using an RJ45. It's probably a plastic connector. So it's just a simple connector that presses into the PCB. And then you have your pins coming off of this magnetic coupling circuit that then route over to this connector. This type of situation where you don't have ground involves discrete magnetics where the magnetics are placed as individual components or idealized here as this circuit block, then you route out from the magnetics over to the RJ45. The RJ45 is then connected to its own copper pore region 
and then there are some other passives to bridge that connection. But the point here is that they are recommending that in this region that you shouldn't have ground below this section of the PCB. So that means in this region, you're now gonna have to go over here, and if you want to use Altium Designer to calculate the impedance of these traces, what you need to do is what I've done here, where you basically simulate having a very large distance to the ground plane by basically just putting large numbers in here. So for example, I can put like a thousand mils in for my spacing between my signal layer and whatever the nearest plane layer is. Well then, in that case, you can see here that it's basically converged to what the width value is going to be, regardless of the location of the ground. Same thing here with coplanar. So here in this document, you can see here that they do actually have this as coplanar, right? There is ground on the same plane as these signals. It's just that the ground is far enough away that this ground does not modify the impedance of these signals. Now, back in this region where you are on layer one and you have a digital ground plane between the component and the magnetic circuit, in that case, you then need to use your intended stack up values here for the thickness. So now you have a realistic thickness between the signal layer and the plane layer. And then in this case, you'll actually see here that you don't need to have such a small gap. In fact, it's better to have a bigger gap, and there's some reasons that I've written about in the past for having that larger gap. So I encourage you to check the link in the description because there's a blog that explains why it's sometimes better to have a larger gap rather than a smaller gap. But in any case, we can go back to the same situation that we had before. So we can use that width with our five mil laminate. If we do this, you'll see that the trace gap here causes the impedance to be too low. So we need to make that trace gap larger. And to do that, you can just use the FX button here in the right side of the screen. Just click that and it's going to calculate what the trace gap needs to be automatically. So now in this case, when you do this, you will see that the trace gap is actually about nine mils. So you can use that same width on both sides of the magnetic circuit. You just need to adjust the trace gap in order to hit the impedance target. In this case, over the ground plane, you want a wider trace gap because that reduces the coupling between the two signals through reducing their capacitance or their mutual capacitance. And that's what gives you that higher impedance that causes you to then hit your target. So going back to this recommendation for a moment here in the routing checklist, where we don't have the ground below these traces, is it appropriate to do this in every situation? Well, that's gonna be a topic for an upcoming video. So in our next video, I'm actually gonna discuss these grounding recommendations for ethernet because depending on which application note you're looking at, you will see different recommendations being put out there for different types of ethernet systems, also for different types of RJ45s. So I'm gonna give you a little hint here. There are actually RJ45 connectors that include this magnetic circuit built into the connector, and they will include the termination circuit built into the connector. So in that case, you then have to ask yourself, do I need to worry about these grounding recommendations? That's the question I'm gonna answer in the next video, so make sure to tune in to that next video as soon as it comes out. Thanks for watching, everybody. Make sure to hit that like button, hit the subscribe button, leave your comments and questions in the comments section, and last but not least, don't forget to call your fabricator, folks. Yeah.